Come on, son, 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 son. <laughs> Welcome to Come On Son, the podcast. I'm Ed Love. Of course, you guys already know that. And this is my podcast brought to you by CigarsInternational.com. Go to CigarsInternational.com for all of your cigar needs, okay? CigarsInternational.com. When you check out Ed 10 first, okay? That's what you want to do. Check out Ed 10 first. That's what you want to do, okay? I'm going to take y'all back. On this podcast, on the night of April 19th, 1989, March of 89, we started Yom TV Raps today. This happened in April 1989. A 28-year-old jogger was brutally attacked and raped in Central Park. It took the entire city and the world by storm. Now, had she been black, I don't think it would have got that much coverage. But because it was a white woman, it got this a whole lot of coverage. She was found unconscious with a skull fracture, her body temperature at 84 degrees, and 75% of her blood drained from her body. When she recovered, she had no memory of the assault. Initially, police investigations quickly focused on a group of African American and Latin youth who were in police custody for a series of other attacks perpetrated in the park that night. After prolonged periods of police Interrogation, five teenagers, Yusef Salam, Kevin Richardson, Antron McCray, Raymond Santana, and Corey Wise, excuse me, confessed to being involved in the attack. At the time, the defendants were between 14 and 16 years old. Richardson, McCray, Santana, and Wise all gave videotape, videotape confessions, excuse me. The confessions were presented as evidence, though they offered they differed in the time, location, and participants of the rape. At trial, the prosecutors also presented forensic evidence. A forensic analyst testified that the hair found on the victim was similar to Richardson's hair to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty. Similar. Also presented as evidence was a rock, hall, a rock found near the scene of the crime that had blood and hair on it that was believed to have come from the victim. The following year, all five teenagers were convicted in two separate trials of charges stemming from the, from the attack. It didn't take Donald Trump, who is now the 41st, 45th president of the United States, long time to take out pages, ads, and stuff, condemning the five youth, calling for the death penalty. And to this day, as the president of the United States, he still says, even though they've been exonerated by DNA, even though there has been someone that confess to it okay that they are guilty my guest today is raymond santana one of the original central park five welcome to the show my brother thank you for having he me. spent five years in prison for a crime that he did not commit but was exonerated on december 19 2002 santana was tried as a juvenile and convicted of rape and assault in the central park five case welcome to the show bro has your record been wiped clean yes it has Absolutely. So there's no record of anything. Yeah. Um, they wiped the records clean. Also, um, when you look on like the uh, docs database, mm -hmm. um, it, it, it doesn't appear there like it never existed. Just like it's never existed. Yeah. Why did you confess? Um, what happened is that you have to look at the dynamics of the case. First of all, how old were you? I was 14 years old. You were 14? Yeah, 14 years old, never had any involvement with the law, didn't know about law, you know, I never, you know, I don't have a law degree or nothing like that. So, right. So it was all about not knowing, the unknown. And, 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 and we get that question a lot. How is it that you can confess to something that you never did? And so you have to look at the dynamics first as far as how is the football field weighed? or the mm -hmm. baseball field, and these are seasoned veteran detectives who have been on the force over 20 years. This was the elite of the police force, right. the Homicide North Detective Squad. Right. They do this in their sleep. And here we were, 14 to 15 year kids who never had no involvement with the law. And so when you get into those situations, you don't know what's going to happen. And so it amounts to pressure. You know what I'm saying? When the, it, it, the question it starts off very simple. What happened? What did you see? Who was you with? And as it keeps going, it mounts and it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Did they threaten you? Yes, yes, several times. With physical violence? Yes, several times. I mean, 
for me, it happened about three different times, right? It's estimated that we was in those interrogation rooms from 8 to 48 hours. Jesus Christ. Straight. 15, 15 to 30 hours straight. Um, never letting up. Um, and, and mind you, for me, my, my, my grandmother was also in the room. And she spoke very little English. So he had to, uh, he was a Spanish-speaking detective by the name of Detective Arroyo. And so he would have to stop and then translate. And after a while, that gets tiring. So what happened is that for me was that it was a knock at the door, right? Mm -hmm. And the Spanish-speaking detective came in and he asked my grandmother to step out. Once she stepped out that door, that's when it starts. You know, um, for me, they had a tall detective come in. Is and, that legal to ask your grandmother to step out of the interrogation room? They're interrogating you. Yeah, but she didn't know. She right. didn't know. And, and, and it looks harmless at that moment, right? So when she steps out the room, it's like all he is, he's telling the outside, look, we don't think that he's telling us everything. We think he's holding back. And, but she don't know. She's just like, all right, I don't see nothing happening in the room, so it's safe to step out. Right. Right. And, and that's when they start working on me. You know, and they started with this tall detective who walks in and he's talking to the detective and he gives me this look and he curses at me. Right. right? And and he says, you know, can I curse on this? Yeah, yeah, it's a podcast. And, and, right. <laughs> so he goes, what the fuck are you looking at? And at that moment, this is the guy You're got, 14 years 14 old. 14 years old. This guy got to be over six feet. And I'm, and I'm kind of like, whoa. And then he make, he has a cup of coffee in his hand and he makes like this step like he's going to come towards me. Right. And at that moment, the knock comes back. And my grandmother comes in, the guy walks out. So, and then the question starts over. Who were you with? What did you see? What, uh, but they was more focused on the jogger, which we had no knowledge of. We didn't ever saw a jogger, nothing. What were you doing in the park? Uh, what happened was that on April 19th, it was a holiday, uh -huh. right? So, we didn't have school. And when we don't have school, I can stay out a little later, right? I had a curfew. My uh -huh. curfew was 9 o'clock. Um, and some of my boys was like, we going to a party over in Schaumburg houses. Okay. And so back then we was like, all right, let's go over to Schaumburg. Let's see if we can bag some of the girls and whatever. Absolutely. And so we go over to Schaumburg and, um, the Schaumburg boys, they was in, you know, they was, that was, that's their backyard. And so me going with a group went over there and that's how that group became very big. Okay. Now whose idea was it to go in the park? I, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? But the central, the, the, the 110th street entrance is right across the street. Right. So it starts off with let's just go there, and I just follow. Originally, I'm from I was I was born in Harlem, I moved to the Bronx, and then I came back okay. to Harlem. I never been in the park like that, so this was just me being a follower, following my boys. Right. You know As we mean? all we've all done it, and, and and that's what happened, and that's how I got caught up. I didn't know Yusuf, I didn't know Antron, I didn't know Corey, I didn't know Kevin. Wow. I didn't know none of them. You know what I'm saying? And and so. And, and, you know, when, when you look at the tactics, th that's how you, it's easy to understand how we was able to be manipulated because we didn't know each other. Right. I didn't know them. Right. You know? And so when you get back to the questioning, by the time the second knock comes at the door, it's the same detective. He takes my grandmother back out. And, th and at this time, between each knock, it's hours have passed. Nobody said you're under arrest. Nobody no. read you your rights. No. Nothing. No. No. It's just, it's just... And at that point, we're 14 years old. We don't even know what Miranda rights are. That's right. You don't know that you could get up and leave. We don't know. If you're not going to arrest me, I could go. You don't know that at we don't 14 know none of that. years old. No. You know what I'm all we know is that we're there and we're answering questions, and they keep talking about this woman that we know nothing of. The second knock comes, and he takes my grandmother out. Now, this time, a short detective comes in. He has red hair. And he starts talking about me. That's the little motherfucker that did it. He's like, yeah, but he don't want to give us everything. So this dude pulls up a chair next to me, and he starts to talk very forcefully in my ear. You know you fucking did it. You stuck your fucking dick in her. You're going to jail. At this point, I'm kind of shook. Now I'm like, whoa, because he's actually here. Right. The detective in front of me, he gets up. He starts yelling at me. So they both hitting me from both angles. The knock comes back. My grandmother comes in. They proceed like nothing happened. Right. All right, Raymond, start from the top. What happened? Give us the whole thing. I tell him the story. But I get to the jogger. I don't know. How, how can I tell you something that I don't know? I right. never saw it. So at this point, the knock comes back again. And my grandmother steps out, right? And, and, and um, at this point, the detective who's actually questioning me is the one who bangs on the table. I'm tired of this shit. You're not telling me what, you, what I want to hear. You know what it is. And I'm like, I don't know nothing. And now he lunges at me like he's going to grab me. At this point, I feel... I'm not going to make it out this precinct. Right. I'm, I'm about to die. I'm about to die. And you're 14. And I'm 14. And your mind is so underdeveloped. It's 
totally ridiculous. It's racing. And so at that point, when he lunges towards me, there's another detective in the room who I didn't see come in, right? And he's standing in the corner. And at that moment when Detective Royal lunges towards me, this detective runs in and stops him, right? And he yells at him, what the fuck are you doing? Are you crazy? Get the fuck. Kicks him out the room. Right. Walks him to the door, closes the door, and now I'm sitting there like, this dude just saved my life. You know what I'm saying? I don't right. know who he is, but he just saved He's me. a good guy. He's a good guy. He's a good guy. And this is how he comes back and he starts to say, you know, Raymond, you know, I know you a good kid. I know you ain't do this shit. Right. These kids, you know, they in priests and saying that you did it. And I don't want to see you go to jail for them. I need help. And I'm still like. Lying like a motherfucker. How can I help you when I don't know? Right. So, you know, he had to, f he had to feed me stuff of stuff that they perceived to be facts. So, like, for, for like, the, the, the brick, um, how that came about was that, because he asked me, he said, you know, this jogger, this woman running the park lost a lot of blood. We don't know if she's going to make it. She might die. Something had to be used with her injuries because she sustained all these injuries in the face, the face and the head area. And he said, a rock, a brick, a pipe. Something had to be used, Raymond. I don't know what it was. What was it? Right. And as a 14-year-old kid, I'm sitting there like, damn, how do I get out this shit? Right? And so the breaking point for me was that he just showed me this picture of Kevin Richardson. And he said, do you know who this person is? And I said, no. And he said, that's Kevin Richardson. He got arrested tonight also. Do you see that scratch on his face? And I said, all right, I can see it in the photo. Right. And he says, that came from the woman. She was fighting him off, and he, she scratched him on the face. Now he going to jail, but I don't want you to go to jail, so I need your help. And then he just sat back and waited for me. Right? And that was my cracking point, that I just said, well, Kevin did it. Right. Well, what did Kevin do? Well, Kevin raped her. You know what I'm saying? I couldn't tell him details because I didn't know. And from there, he just fed it to me. What he perceived to be the facts is what he fed me. And that's how that part came about. Wow. Wow. And so, and so um, even the, the brick, you know, when it's presented at trial as the, as the weapon that was used in the case, when it's retested years later, there's nothing on it. Right. You know what I'm saying? And, but that brick made the front page of the Newsday. Right. You know, and, 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 and that's how... Um, sometimes it's hard for older adults to look at that and say, you know, how can somebody confess? But when you apply pressure at the right time and the person feel like they're hopeless and they can't get away. Well, well, at that time at in 1989, <laughs> yeah, you could say you have to remember that you, have, you guys are 14, 15, the oldest one being 16 years old. Yeah. They're kids. And then in 1989, you're looking at it like, I would never confess to something I didn't do. But now if you turn on A&E and you watch the first 48, you see it every damn day. That's right. Because you see the pressure, the tactics that they use. And one of the biggest tactics that the police will use on you is, let me know so I can help you. Yeah. I'm going to let you go home, Raymond. Yeah. We know you didn't have nothing to do with it. Just tell me what Kevin did. And you can go home, not knowing that as soon as you start talking, that because you're with him, you're an accessory. That's right. That you're just as guilty as, and it's the kind of shit, like, I got to teach my kid. Mm -hmm. Like, if you're in a car with niggas and niggas got a gun, they throw it on the floor, you're going to jail for that gun. Yeah. But, Dad, I ain't do nothing. If you with your man, your man lean out the car and shoot somebody, you need to, as soon as he drop you off, take your ass to the priest and tell on him because you're an accessory to murder if that mm -hmm. person dies. And you don't know because you're 14 years old. You've yeah. never been arrested for anything before. No, never. And it happens all the time. It happens all the time. Right. You, you were being raised by your grandmother? No, I was re re being raised by my dad. Okay. A and he had to go to work. And because it was just a disappearance ticket, family court. Right. He was like, all right, just stay with him. They're going to let him go. Just take him home. I'll deal with him later. Right. You know? And, and and that turned into seven years later. You know, that's just how it went. Wow. You know, and, and, and the whole time, so even when they take the DNA evidence from us and they took handprints, footprints, hair, blood samples, they took our clothes, everything. And and they thought it was a slam dunk case, and then they sent it to the lab and nothing came back. As right, there's nothing on it. So how in the fuck did you get convicted? And that's what, and, and so... Even us as 14 and 15 year old kids, we said this would tell people like something's wrong. Right. This would tell the DA, the police, backtrack. Maybe we slipped up somewhere. And they mm -hmm. never did. They took a square piece and stuck it in the circuit and said it looks nice. Put a bow on it and let's go. Because 
What happened was that bef- when we were arrested, within the first two weeks of this case, there were over 400 articles written about the Central Park Jogger case. Mm-hmm. So it already made people's minds up predetermined. Somebody got paid for it. Somebody got to pay for it. And, 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 and this was the early of the criminalization of the black man. Right. Right? You know how Trayvon, yeah, he, you know, he, he wear a hoodie, so it made it look bad, right? He had Michael Brown, he, you know, he, he got caught stealing out of a store, right? The stuff that they put out there to make people go, well, maybe he was at the right. wrong Right, y'all were wilding, ta- coined the phrase wilding. Yeah. Y'all yeah. were wilding in the park, assaulting people, fighting people, and robbing people. And that didn't even come from us. Um, that was something that they made up to then gave it a, 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 a meaning or to say like this is what it means right packs of kids rampaging through places they're not supposed to be. well y'all just hanging out hanging out chilling chilling drinking now, a little have a little beer not, not even drinking just hanging out because there was still that party but right. what happened was that this group walked into central park and kept walking now it was you know over 30 kids some of them dudes were doing bad things. Some of them, a lot, it wasn't just the five of us who went right. to jail. Right, it, it was 30 of y'all, 30, 40 p- kids. It, it's really, it could have been Central Park 15 because there's a bunch of kids who got robbery charges, assault charges, and took those charges and said, I was guilty, I'm going to serve my time. But there was never no woman. You know what I'm saying? And, right. And, and so we were the ones who were the most naive, who didn't do anything but got caught up. Right. So when they came in, okay, so initially... When the cops came, they rounded up everybody? No. It took them. It took them. How did they pinpoint y'all five? Well, what happened was that they, it, what happened was that upon leaving the park, right, we was on Central Park West walking uptown. Uh-huh. I had to follow a group because I had never been on the west side. I didn't know where the hell was that. <laughs> okay. Two patrol cars pulled up. The group scattered. By this time, the group is maybe like 10, 15 guys. Right. A lot of people left. Corey wired the story. Corey never even entered. He entered the park in the beginning. And the first sign of police, he left. He went home. Right? And so, and so he, these two patrol car, a patrol car pulls up, the crowd scatters. One officer grabs me, another officer grabs a guy by the name of Steven Lopez. Puts us on the wall, arrests us, well, handcuffed us, put us, put us in the car. And then the one officer, he jumps over the wall and he goes to chase after somebody else. And he catches Kevin Richardson. Right. And so that's how we wound up in the precinct. So that night it was me, Stephen Lopez, Kevin Richardson, uh, Lamont McCall and a guy and another kid. Right. These ain't part of the Century Bar Five. Their names are not there. Right. It was us five that was originally in the precinct that night. Now, due to interviewing, then they got names. So they went back and said, okay, they went looking. They had a list of kids they went looking for. And so, according to the DA's office, they interviewed over 40 kids, but we were the only ones who became the Central Park Five, right? And another five, six kids, they got, like, robbery charges and misdemeanor charges, trespassing, stuff like that. How the fuck are you trespassing in the park? Was the park, did the park close at a certain time I have no idea. How are you trespassing <laughs> in Central Park? How is she not trespassing in Central Park, but you're trespassing in Central Park? Yeah, I, I have, I have, you know, I don't, like, Never saw this woman. Don't, never. Never. Couldn't give a description of what this woman looks like. Nothing. Nothing. Couldn't, the first time I actually saw this woman was when she came to trial to testify about the injury she sustained in her recovery. She couldn't point us out. She couldn't say it was them. Nothing. 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 And there was two, DA, two DNA markers. There was a sock that had semen on it, uh-huh. and then there was semen that was found in her. Right. Right. And none of that stuff connected to none of us. I'm going to ask you again, Ray. <laughs> how the fuck did you get convicted? And I, We say this all the time. How the fuck did we get convicted? Like, like it was, A jury came a, back and said that you were guilty. A jury came back. A jury came back and said. No that DNA, was, no eyewitness account of nothing. Of no, nothing. No, the woman couldn't say, yeah, he did it. He got on top of me. He penetrated me. This one hit me with the brick. This one. It was one, one, uh. There's only one person semen inside of her, right? That's it. One person. Which turned out to be years later when you get exonerated yeah. that this this guy yeah. that had been doing shit like that. Yeah. He was he was known as the East Side Slasher. Right. East Side Rapist. East Side Rapist. That was his semen inside of her. Yeah. 
That okay, was your team is your DNA, no fingerprints on her, no hair. Nothing. No nothing. Nothing. What the fuck did they present to the jury that made the jury say, yeah, those are, they did it? Videotape statements of us telling the story and written statements. Right. And, and so in, in the documentary, you know, let's there's, there's talk about this one juror who holds out. He tries to hold out as long as he can. And when me and him had a conversation years later, he says, you know, Ray, the thing that, that had me so complex, you know, about this case was that your story was different than Antron's. Yusuf never even made a statement. So it was only two statements in this trial. Right. If I believe yours, I can't believe Antron's. Right. It's two different stories. Two totally different stories. So he's like, so how do I convict any of you guys? But the jury was like, they put pressure on them to convict us. Wow. The rest of them. Everybody else just wanted to blame. What was your jury made up of? Mostly what? It was mixed. Mixed? Yeah. Okay. It was mixed. So you're looking at this jury like, okay, there's some Latinos, some brothers yeah. and sisters on there. No fucking way I'm getting convicted. No, of no way. And then you're 14. Yeah. Yeah. When you heard guilty, what is your mindset? Well, they read, they read Antron's, uh, uh, they read his verdict first. Mm -hmm. Once they read his, I was like, I'm done. Mines was last. So it right. was Antron's, then Yusuf, then Mines. Right. And and I was like, yeah, it's over. Once they read his, like, we we we, we beat the attempted murder charge mm -hmm. and um, everything else, we was guilty. Right. On, like, 10, 11 accounts. So you're 14, were well, you 15 at this time? Yeah. Do they, what, did they sentence you as a juvie? Yeah, yeah. So you had to go to juvenile? Yeah. But yeah. it's still fucked up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Five years in juvie you did? Yeah, I, yeah. I did all together, I did almost seven years. Yeah, I had a five to ten year sentence, and you know, with those type of charges and that type of case, Pro Bowl is not letting you go on the first one. They're gonna hit you with two years, come back. I see all that. I earned my release date. Right. Yeah. What is your mindset when they when they taking you away for some shit you know? <laughs> my lawyer came back there at the time. My lawyer came back there, and he was like, um, he said, you know, I'm sorry. This is the end of the line for me. He said, I put your appeal in. And he was like, um, five years is not that long. Good luck. Five years is not that long. Good luck? Yeah. And what I, a fuck, boy. And I said, well, won't you fucking take this five years and let me go home? But it was, yeah. I mean, I guess people who have, like, because there were several correction officers, even court officers, who sat there day in and day out, and they heard testimony, and they would come back there and say, yo, you're going home. You're going to beat this shit. And I'm right. like, yeah. Even they were stunned. Even they were stunned, like, you fucking got convicted? Like, how? No, yeah. They couldn't understand it. They, I can't understand it. No, I, I can't understand this shit at all. With no evidence to support it at all, a jury still found you gentlemen guilty? Mm -hmm. Tell me about when you got exonerated. How did that, how did the whole process start? Um, Walk me through this. So what happened was that at this point, Corey Wise was in Auburn Correctional Facility as a max prison, mm -hmm. upstate New York, and he was he in a grown man ass prison. Yeah, he yeah from sixteen, and he he did about thirteen and a half years, right? And so he um he's uh uh he's walking the yard one day, and at this time he, he got he, his feet are giving him a lot of problems, so he walked with a limp, and the guy Mateus Reyes is in the same prison as him. Now, back in 1989, we got locked up in April. I think Reyes might have got locked up around June, July. Okay. Right? So him and Corey happened to be on the same house. They had a fight over the TV. Right? So you fast forward 13 years later, Reyes sees him spin in the yard, walk in the yard, and he stops him to talk to him. And he says, hey, you remember me? We had a fight back in, in, on C-74. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I remember. And they have a conversation. Reyes never tells him that he committed the crime. All Reyes did was just tell him about what he's been through, what he's going through, how he's found religion, he's found God, and Corey supported him on that. Right. And from there, he went back to his cell, and he, he developed a guilty conscience. And he said, you know what? This guy's in here for something I did. I need to say something. And he told several people, and they was like, yeah, say something. So he went to the prison chaplain, told him first. They told him, you got to do the right thing. And he really, literally went up the ladder every step of the way until it got to the attorney general's office and then the DA's office. And then from there, the DA, uh, they said, well, let's test the DNA. They tested the DNA. It was a match. Now, this guy, <clears throat> he's serving 33 and the third years to life for the rape and murder of a pregnant woman. Right. Right. And he had about six or seven rapes under his belt. 
Um, this guy literally had to prove to the system that he was the culprit. Like, if he would have said, well, it was me and they was there, they would have wrapped it up and said, oh, yeah, we got the last man, we good. Right. But because he was saying, no, you know my M.O., I do all my crimes by myself. All his victims are bound and gagged with the same injuries, right? Um, and that's with their hands to the face because he tied them up and he blinded them so they couldn't ID him. Right. And so um, he literally, there was an eight-month to a year-long investigation, right, of them trying to connect us, right? And so he still, he, still, still, even after the DNA comes back, even after DNA comes back, and this guy, and we sitting there, and this dude is like. You know, I'm going to show you how real it is. He gave them about four unsolved cases. They went back and reinvestigated those, and they was like, oh, he did these. So he's like, I'm telling you the truth. Like, these dudes ain't had nothing to do with it. And so the whole investigation, they're trying to connect us. We found um, during our civil trial, we uh, we got some, some documents from one of the lead detectives who was trying to help with the reinvestigation because there was a problem between them and Robin Morgenthau, who was the head DA at the time. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't let them in the investigation because we found a notepad, and the notepad had like three points, and one of the points was connect the boys to Reyes. So here was the DA's office saying, nah, we can't trust you guys because you guys are dirty, and you guys are trying to frame these kids again. You know? Um, and at this point, the commissioner was Ray Kelly. Mm -hmm. And um, we did his deposition, and Ray Kelly actually sat in a deposition and said, um, Reyes is incredible. He isn't credible for the Jogger case, but he's credible for the murder and the seven or eight other rapes. Why isn't he credible for the Jogger case? And, and we sat there like, are you was serious? Ray, was Ray Kelly the, the uh, head of the police department when you got convicted? No, was not. He came in with many years after. Right. Um, he, they even tried to assign. He tried. He came first to, to the DA's office, and he said, I want to help out with the investigation. I'm going to give you a department to strictly be under you guys, and you do whatever you want with them. This was the Homicide North Detective Squad. Right. The same department that convicted that us. That convicted you. They tried to give him the same department to help with the reinvestigation. Right. That don't make sense. That don't make sense. And, and, and at this point, the DA's office was like, no. And we have an email from the DA's office telling them, you guys are dirty. There's stuff being leaked to the media. You, you guys are doing all this underhand stuff. You will not talk to Reyes. Like, we got it. And right. this, this is how deep it went that they was like, you know, they was Once willing. we got that conviction, we're going to keep that conviction. These are the guys that did it. I don't give a damn if Jesus himself come down and said they ain't have nothing to do with it. We're not believing it. And that's exactly how it went. And it took us our civil. And, and so. After the uh, eight-month investigation, there was a report by a district attorney by the name of uh, Nancy Ryan, mm -hmm. 52 pages long on how we're innocent. And at that point, they was like, there's nothing we can do. You guys you guys are innocent. That's it. And so we were exonerated. Um, and then from there, we, we, we... Do you remember the day they came and told you you were leaving? You were going home? Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, the guys, at this point, because it took... It took about maybe three months after the investigation was rolling until we got the um, uh, uh, the exoneration. Right. The guys, in, at this point, I was, in, I was in jail. I was serving the time for a drug case. Okay. And um, the guy, like the whole jail rallied behind me. And they was all, like that day that they knew that it was coming, mm -hmm. they was just waiting. And when it came, you know, the jail went crazy. And, and maybe two days later, I was gone. Mm. You know? Wow. How do you, it's got to be like. All this anticipation in you, you know you're leaving, you can't sleep, yeah. you can't eat, yeah. you're afraid. Yeah. There's a part of you that's afraid, right? Yeah, definitely. Because everybody knows you're going home, Yeah. so maybe somebody trying to, that they don't like you yeah. want to do something to make you stay. Yeah, it's true. Start some shit with you, try to shank you, make you, you know, plant something in your cell. Yeah. Like, there's all of this feelings going through your brain. Yeah, it's true, definitely. I de and, and, I even, and even the COs, because this is... Nine hours away from New York City. Right. right. This is upstate New York by the Canadian border, you know, racist ass police, right? And even them. That was the first thing my lawyer said. He was like, listen, if you have a problem, we'll get the DA's office to get you out of there. Because Corey, that happened to Corey. Okay. Before, when, before, right before Corey was exonerated, he had a problem with an officer because the officer liked to beat up guys who were convicted of sex crimes. Okay. And the guy told him, you're on my list. And, and when the lawyers found out, they called the DA's office and they moved them out. Okay. 
you know so so that but that was definitely there Ray, Ray I want to know as a 14 year old kid how do you wrap your head around I'm in jail for something that I did not do how do you get normalized I you know for me it was how do you say okay I'm here I got to deal with it in the beginning it was hard in the beginning it was hard the um, 14 I'd have cried my fucking eyes out every day of the damn week but I felt like I couldn't do that because I was in an environment that they look at that as as a weakness right right so you have to grow up very fast very quickly um and so it took me a while to adjust to programs um and what really got me through was education okay because in the beginning I didn't have you know I, here I was I really didn't have no real education and and I had to go to school in prison and I went to school and I passed these exams and then they said take the GED and I said well I ain't got nothing to lose I'll probably fail it the first time so what I took it and I passed right and so a light bulb went up and said all right you got a little light here and I went from there I went to college in prison. okay back then before Pataki took it out so I was able to go to I was able to go to college and during my um my academics career in there I had this one class it was called uh it was a black history class and the teacher the professor was a guy by the name of Latif Islam who served time in Attica during the Attica riots he was okay. a professor and so he gave us all these books on the syllabus and I was like what's all these books for if we only use it one and he said young brother that's for your arson you don't you don't get it right now but you will and by the time I was halfway through the class, I started to read these other books. And the other books was Mal uh, uh, Autobiography of Malcolm X. A uh, book that changed my life, man. Yeah, yeah. That was the first book I read. Right. A People's History by How It's In, Black Economics, uh, The Miseducation of the Negro by Carter G. Woodson. So now, as I'm going through this class, I'm in the side reading these books. And I'm like, wow. And then off of that, I started to understand what happened to us. And that became the awakening for me, mm. that I was like, mm -mm, never again. Right. You know. How do you not become the most, now that you're exonerated, you're home, y'all sued the city mm -hmm. and won. How do you not become the most bitter motherfucker that ever walked the face of the earth? I don't know. I, for me, it was never about being bitter. It was, it, was, it was about walking the path, keep walking the path. Because you, you, it's like, that's a sign of weakness. Because everybody's, you know, because you are the one part of the infamous Central Park Five, it's almost like he going to do something. He going to fuck up. Yeah. And you I, know what I mean? Because the recidivism rate is, is crazy. For and, I, and I did at the time. You right. Know, I went back to jail for a drug case because of that. Because I couldn't land a job. Here I was with a rape conviction, Central Park Five. Filling out applications and you guys. And you say, have to put that down? Yeah, yeah. Have you ever been convicted of a crime? Back then, yeah. But I, even if it's been white. No, now, no, no. Now I don't have okay. to put nothing. <laughs> yeah, right. Back then. Back then. That's the reason why I went back to jail because I couldn't okay, get Okay, so first, before you got exonerated, you were already out? No, I was in jail. Okay, you was in jail and then you jail. get exonerated, then you come home. Then I come home. And you still have to write down. No, at that point, no. Okay. At that point, no. At that point, I went back to college. I was trying to work on the, finishing up a degree. Um, I was working at Mega Evers College at the time. Mm -hmm. um, they were very supportive of me. Um, and then what happened was I had a I had a baby. My, my girl at the time had a daughter. I had my okay. daughter. And I was like, I go to work. You know what I'm saying? So I, right. put, I put the college on hold, and then I went to work. But because I was exonerated, because I was the cent part of the Central Park Five, there was another part of the story and that became the activism part like right now you have to go out there you have to speak you have to walk the walk you got to walk in eggshells you know you got a civil suit pending they're not going to pay you right you got to fight for that right so that was another why activity. is that such a problem you wrongfully convicted somebody and sent them to prison yeah yeah why do you have a problem giving money well what happened was that first off they, they you know they came at us they came to the lawyers and they said, well, you know, we're going to settle this case. So the lawyer's like, all right. And then they, the offer they gave us was something that I was like. <laughs> disrespectful. Disrespectful. And so the lawyer's like, we're not going to do that. So what he did was he dropped a federal lawsuit. We were the first exonerees that ever dropped a federal lawsuit. Everybody went through court of claims, mm -hmm. right? We went through the feds. And so they were taken back by that. They didn't understand why we did that. And so um, after that, you know, Bloomberg is in office by this time. 
it's a no pay case in his mind. He's not paying nothing. Mm -hmm. We find out that Bloomberg, in Bloomberg's history, he worked at Solomon Brothers. That's where he got fired from, mm -hmm. right? And his service package was about $10 million. The Jago also worked at Solomon Brothers. So there was the connection why he wasn't going to settle the case. Um, and so it literally took us 11 years to fight a civil suit, right? And, and 11 years? 11 years to fight a civil suit. About 11, 10 years, about 10 years. Wow. 10 years to fight a civil suit. At this point, the city was really against, like, not paying at all. And they were upset because we filed a civil suit in the feds. And, and when I spoke to the lawyer and I asked him why, and he said, yeah, because at the end of the day, the feds are supposed to be neutral. So when they tell you go in that room and get all those documents, they're going to give you all those documents. And that opened up the whole case for us. Okay. My lawyers was actually able to sit down and dissect the whole case on everything that went wrong. Wow. You know, and, and, and so now it just became a stall tactic for the city. Let's just stall them out as long as we can. and Until they pay. drop it. Until they drop it. Yeah. But and we, you guys had to wherewithal to stay with it. Yeah. Because yeah. it could happen to somebody else. And, exactly. let, and let it be an example Yeah. to the next kid that walks into a park that gets thrown into the back of a police car and interrogated for 72 hours and wrongfully convicted with no DNA. You know, we looked at the, the Khalif Browder story. Mm -hmm. So sad. And they do it all the fucking time. Yeah. Yeah. All the time. All the time. Even for exonerees, people who have been exonerated, you know, you come out, you file a case, you file a suit, you try to get some money, they fight you on that. Right. We was the first case that, like, kicked that door in. And was like, nah, we not having it. And and now behind us, a lot of exonerees have gotten paid. Right. You know? Yeah. But and you see it in other states and, and, and other places around the country. You see guys coming home seventeen years convicted for murder they didn't yeah. do. And then they want to give them ah I'll give them three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I did seventeen fucking years. What are you talking about? Yeah. Yeah. My thought process should be if you wrongfully convicted, it should be at least a million dollars a year for every year I done spent locked up. You could have lost your life in there. That's right. That's right. You could have died in there. Yeah. For some shit that you didn't do and you were 14 years old. Mm -hmm. I remember this shit like it was yesterday. It was fucking war on young black men in America. It was war. If you was up, we couldn't even walk around in a pack of more than three. Yeah. Because we were fucking scared. Over 40 states changed juvenile laws behind our case. Hillary Clinton, you know, with, with Bill Clinton at the time saying uh, super predator. Super that was predator. That was, that was due to us. Right. That was due to us. Isn't that funny? Yeah. The, how that super predator shit came to bite her in the ass. Yeah. And then she wondered why we didn't vote for her for president. Yeah. If we would have went out <laughs> for her. The way we went out for Barack, she would be the president of the United States right now. That's and she don't get it that that super predator shit that you backed your husband on. Yeah. And a lot of young black people went to jail because of that. And the three strikes law came under your fucking husband, That's bitch. Right. All right. He did balance the budget. But, bitch, that was your husband and you backed him. You didn't say no. This ain't right. You, you backed it 100 percent. Yeah. Motherfuckers that got. From L.A. to New York City, the Rampart Division, New York City, planting drugs and guns on motherfuckers. Knew they already had two strikes. They doing life. 100% correct. You backed it. Yeah. All right? Y'all back it because what the government does is use scare tactics to keep white people, <laughs> to give them money for war and to give them money for more policing. That's right. They 100%. use scare tactics. That's right. They, oh, it's been going on from day one. These are all oh, black people, predators. They're uh, they angry about everything. They don't know how to fucking act. Blacks and Latinos, look at them. they predators. We got to do something. It's a, one crime, 40 different states change the law. Yeah, yeah. And I never heard the word wilding before into your case. Yeah. That word wasn't even And at out the same there. time, in New Jersey, there was a case where it was like five white kids, and, <coughs> and they raped or sexually assaulted a girl who was like, mentally retarded yes and they were looked at as oh well these are just boys right they're just but, boys but for us we were monsters we were urban terrorists we were super predators you know you look at the uh the uh you know how they have the people in the courtroom that draw the sketches yeah and you look at how she sketched us and even she said it. she apologized years later and she said yeah you know i did draw these boys in a dark light like to make them look like they were savages and, and right. to make them look like they were monsters and this shit happened to you because you went to a party at Schomburg and walked into Central Park. Yeah, didn't even get to the party. 
That's that's all you did. That's all I did. That's all I did. That's all I did. And 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 because of that, because of that decision, you know. But that's not a bad decision. It's not a bad. It's decision. not like motherfuckers <laughs> said, "Yo, I'm gonna go rob this bank, or we gonna rob this grocery store." Raid, stand out. Stand the fuck outside and look out. <laughs> if you see police go woo woo, and you were scared to death, so you like, I, right, I'm gonna do that. All right, dummy, you sh- when they went in the store, you should have fucking ran. Yeah, should have ran. Right, yeah. but all you did was anything that I would have did. You introduced me to your nephew. Your nephew would have did it. My son would have did it. Anything that any young kid would do. Oh, there's a party. Let's go. Oh, y'all going to the park? Let's go. Let's walk in the park, and then all of a sudden, I'm going to fucking what? Yeah. You ruined my life. Yeah. Yeah. You put a tag on me. Yeah. That I can't get rid of. Right. I will always be part of the Central, Central Park, Park Five. Five. Dudes that you ain't know. Yeah. It's not like, you know, you know, we thought y'all were cool. We thought all y'all motherfuckers was together. <laughs> we thought, seriously, the way, this is why yeah. I always listen to people now, and I think somebody said it the other day. I, I did a thing on Biggie and Tupac, and then, and the uh, producer of the show said, look behind the headlines. Don't believe every fucking thing you read. Because what we thought was, oh, them five motherfuckers was in the park. I never believed the wild and shit. Because I'm like, white people don't know what the fuck they talking yeah, yeah, about. Yeah. All right? <laughs> so I was like, but they know each other. I didn't know until this day. Till you just said, I ain't even know them motherfuckers. I didn't know. I didn't know. That's why it was so easy to say, all right, the pressure's on. I don't know, Kevin. Yeah, I'm going to lie because that's what I do as a 14-year-old kid. Absolutely. Anything to save my ass. I want to go home. That's it. You got to figure that shit out later on, not me. You know what I'm saying? Right. And so I lied on him. <coughs> you know what I'm saying? It's Yusuf is not in my statement. Antron is in my statement a little bit. And Steven Lopez was in my statement a little bit. Because Steven Lopez got arrested with me that night. Kevin got arrested that, that, that night. I didn't even know. Whatever happened to Steven Lopez? He, he wound up um, copping out to a robbery charge. Okay, and that was it. Because he was the last person that was supposed to go to trial, and um, they, they did he cop out to something he didn't do though. Yeah, he did. He copped out to something wow. he didn't do. And and and, and 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 let me say, this is crazy because wow. now at this point I'm already upstate. I'm serving the five to ten years. They bring me back down and they offer me a deal, and they said testify against Steve Lopez and we'll drop all your charges. And I said fuck y'all. I'm not testifying against him. Let him beat it. Let him go home. And he copped out, and. A couple months later, he was in the cell right next to me. Really? Really. And he told me, he said, I was scared, Ray. He said, after I saw those two trials and everybody got convicted, I thought I was gone. So I just pleaded. To something that he absolutely didn't do. To something that he absolutely did not do. So the motherfuckers who were actually wilding, did they catch any of them? One person. One person who actually, one person who actually did something and he had an assault charge he served a year, and he said it to this day. Yeah, I did that. I, I, you know, it was a guy by the name of John Lachlan who was running on the reservoir, and this kid Jermaine Robinson walked up to him and punched him in his face and assaulted him. Right. And he's the only person who said, "I'm guilty of that." I did it. Yeah. He did one year. Did one year. One year. Didn't hit him with the rape. None of that. None of that. None of that other shit. None of that other I shit. Can't, I can't even, Ray, I can't even. He's, he's the only Ray person. Ray Santana is my <laughs> podcast guest today for uh, Central Park Five. I can't wrap my hand around, I can't wrap my mind around that. I can't wrap my mind around. It's the biggest fear. And one of the white people out here that's listening to my podcast, I'm not jumping on you because you were born white, but I need you to understand where we're coming from as minorities in this country. And if you get a better understanding of it, then maybe we can change things. Our biggest fear is not your fear. Raymond has lived the nightmare that has been my biggest fear from the time that I was old enough to understand what this world was about. My biggest fear has always been being wrongly convicted for something I fucking didn't do. We come from, we don't come from a lot of the means that some of y'all come from. We didn't, we didn't get brand new Porsches and T-Birds and shit like that to drive back and forth to high school. So our parents were getting by to keep us afloat. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have big time lawyer money. So that's that's why they cop because they'll sit there and tell you, you're looking at 25 to 30 or you can cop and take three. Mm Mm-hmm. Your mom is going to look at you and go, I can't afford this lawyer, baby. Take that three. Take that three. And yeah. you know you didn't do shit. That's right. And it happens to us the same way the cops roll up on you, 
Get your hands out your pocket. You pull out your cell phone, they shoot you 20 fucking times. They just did this shit. Mm -hmm. It's the same way that y'all think the numbers are up in prison because we're predators and animals. And you are a living testament that the numbers are up in prison because they railroad motherfuckers right. in prison. That's right. Because it's all about that budget. When Bloomberg came into office, look at the police budget and how much it jumped each year. Right. And then he told you, I want the police force to be a small army. And you're talking budgets of 3.3 billion, 3.4 billion, 3.6 billion. And how do you get the city council and the people to approve that budget? Make an example out of people and make people live in fear. That's right. 100%. 100%. And they did it with terrorism. Oh, oh yeah. Terrorism is coming oh, yeah. You got to get the money. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's why I'm a conspiracy theorist on 9-11. Mm -hmm. I too. really do think that this city, <laughs> this country will sacrifice the lives of people to get money mm -hmm. and to get more money. I believe that they will let that shit happen because they knew those losers in this country. Thank you. All right? They just one hand didn't talk to the other hand, didn't talk to the other hand. But let, let, let them fuck up that world trade shit. We're going to get more money out of it in the long run. That's right. That's yeah, right. we're going to lose a couple hundred lives. Yeah, that's fine. But you know what? People will rally around the first responders, and then we'll get the government to pour more money into anti-terrorism, this, that, and the third. You know that show of force shit they do in New York mm -hmm. all the time when you yeah. see all the cops yeah. follow each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Meanwhile, somebody's knocking somebody across the head somewhere <laughs> else for their wallet. Yeah, that's right. You know, they show a force, and it's just more money put into this shit and there's no money put into programs no no because you, you said something um before you got educated while you were locked up when before pataki took it out yeah what is that saying yeah i mean it, what it, message is that sending somebody we don't want you to get educated yeah that's what, that's exactly what it is they don't want because people were complaining oh if i want my son to get an education i could just send him to prison so that was one of the things that Pataki ran on, ran on to, to become governor. He's going to pull it out. I got my associate's degree right before he pulled it out. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So now dudes ain't got nothing to do but go to yard. That's it. And become it's not bigger. Even, you can't even get a GED? I think you can. I think but you, you can't can. do college. But you can't do college. Unless it's like something, some type of other program. I think they still have it, but it's not like it used to be. It used to be for everybody. It used to be for everybody. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now it's limited. Unbelievable. You, do you have any contact? Because you guys have become infamous together, do you guys stay in contact? Yeah. You do? Yeah, we have to now. It's almost like... Yeah. It, 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 it's at the point, like, we um, have taken a role of being brothers, right? Like, you know, Yusuf, he lives out in Atlanta. And uh -huh. John lives out here in Atlanta. I live out here. And so our kids call, it, call you know, the uncle. Right. You know? You, you said fuck New York. I didn't say fuck New York. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't. You just ain't want to be around. That shit have to be. I don't blame you, though. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody can blame you for that, though. Like, I'm not going up there with it. You know what y'all fuckers did to me? I'm not going up there. I'm not. I don't. Need... Have you been back to Central Park? I, no, never. 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 Ne I, now, I lived before I came, before I moved out here, I lived on 111th Street between Park and Madison. Know it well. Right? And when my daughter was little, I wouldn't even go in that direction because you know how they got all those playgrounds. Right. I didn't want her to be like, Dad, can I go in there? So I would oh, never go over there. Man. I would take her to other playgrounds until she got old enough to understand, you know, nah. And I, because I lived over there, I see it all the time, walk by it, but I'm not going in that motherfucker. <laughs> I can't blame you, bro. That got to bring back some horrible, horrible yeah. memories. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, to walk down you know, a Central Park West and see the actual spot where I got picked up. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not walking this way either no more. I'm going to turn back go the other way. Right. Like, it just, that's how it is. Did it, did it take away your faith in the justice system? Um, It did at that point. It did for a long time. I mean, my faith was questioned, even spirituality. You know, it, 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 it was questioned a lot. Right. You know, um... And then, I mean, right up, right before you walked in to do this podcast, you know, I had another guest here, Pastor John Gray, did it, and he has such a firm, solid belief in God and and the power and the workings of God and the power workings of Jesus. Did you you question that? Yeah, I did at one time. I did. It took me a long time to not question it, and and one of the things was as I got older, as the five, well, the four of us stepped into the role of being part of the Central Park Five, and then we looked at where we were at at our lives. 
how we had our kids and we had our health and the platform we was given, then it was like this was part of the process, mm. you know, and, and, and we accepted it. And, and, and I got that question, you know, they, they always tell me, they ask me this question. They say, well, if you can go back, would you change it? And I say, nah, I can't. I wouldn't because I don't know where I would have been back then. Mm -hmm. This was the path that I was given, and I walked it, and I'm still walking it, and I'm, and I'm successful at it. You know what I'm saying? To an extent that we are winners. We have fought the system. I got my health. I got my daughter. You know what I'm saying? We have our kids. I can't take it back. Right. I got to keep going forward. And you, you gained through, through a tragedy or something that happened to you, you gained brothers. Yeah. You know, you gained something. And, and now your voice means something. Yeah, definitely. You know, who knows what, what you know, what Raymond Santana would have been. You know what That's I mean? That's what I'm saying. But your voice means something, so it's kind of like there's there was a blessing. It's in there, and all of that. It's just, it's just sometimes it's tough to see it. Yeah, you know. But that's you know that's the grace of God that you're still here and you're still living, man. What what do you tell other young people? Because I don't I don't want us to have to live our lives in fear, but it's almost like we have to. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And I tell them I say you know one thing that we have these young kids that we didn't have that they have is social media. Right. That's one aspect of it because these kids nowadays you can tell us something and they'll go on there and Google it two seconds and then they'll say you're lying. So they do have that they do have that um that ability of not being afraid to speak out. Right. They they do have that. They're not taking stuff on face value. They're really doing the research. They're looking at it. They're dissecting it and then they're calling you on it. So, you know, I tell them but. There's still things that you guys don't know, like mm -hmm. what happened to us. When you get in, in that precinct, you know what I'm saying, those tactics that the police use. That's right. You, you have to arm yourself. You That's have to be right. aware of that. I stuff. found, and, and you know, the funny thing is I found out just actually by watching, like, live trials on television, I remember some kid or somebody was going through the thing, and he said, well, the police said that they would help me, and then the police said that the guy in the other room said that I did it. You know, he was actually there for the for for the crime and shouldn't have had nothing to do with it. But once the cop said, "Well, he said you shot him. I shot him. I ain't the one that shot him. He shot him. You got to You know what I mean? That's a that's yeah. one of the tactics that they use. I was yeah. just there. Yeah. I see it on the first forty eight all the time. They don't understand that you're an accessory for being there. Yeah. I was just there. We were just supposed to take the weed. He the one that shot him. Well, somebody died in a commission. Of a crime, so now you got a capital murder case yeah. instead of a regular murder case. Yeah. But what you don't understand is you can't control other people when you get in the room. The, the plan always start out right. <laughs> We're just going to run up in here. These niggas got weed and money. We're going to take this weed. Nobody's going to get hurt. Yeah. Then your man turn around. I told you to shut the fuck up. Trigger happy. Bam. Yeah. You done killed somebody. Now you going to jail for the rest of your fucking life instead of just the robbery. You got a capital murder charge. It just some states is a lot heavier. Yeah. Than in other states. Mm -hmm. Right. So you down in New Orleans, you're fucked. You can forget it. You never coming home. And you don't understand that. What we got to teach our kids in which nobody taught you. Your dad didn't teach you. Your grandmother didn't teach you. Nobody taught you to say lawyer. That's it. That's the only thing you should have said. That's it. Lawyer. And and that's the first thing I tell my nephews. Yeah. Don't say nieces, shit. I don't daughter. fuck what they say to you. Lawyer. Yeah. Don't say and if Lawyer. You, if you say something though, uncle, call me. Right. <laughs> I had a, I I had a uh I was in a club with my with my wife, she was my fiance then, and she got into it with some uh young ladies that they just kept coming in our circle. We in a club in New York called Bed. And they got into it. The girl just kept bumping into it. She asked her nicely to stop. The girls uh, were trying to get my attention. And they kept bumping into my wife being hated. These are white girls. And my wife just asked and kept asking to stop. And the girl threw a drink in her face. Mm. And they got the scrapping. And then, then a young lady came. I'm trying to break it up. And the young lady comes with fucking like a magnum bottle oh, no. over her head. And I clocked her. Yeah, yeah. Knocked the shit out of her. I got arrested for it. And, um... When I got arrested, well, I went home, and what I should have did is went to the precinct. This is how dumb I am. Went to the precinct and filed, my wife filed assault charges on them also. Mm -hmm. But I, me, like a dummy, let's go. Went home, she goes file charges on me. I don't go to work the next day because I fucking knew they was going to come looking for me. So I got my attorney. I turned myself in. I get in the precinct. You know, they love to do the perp walk on Ed Lover so it can be yeah. in the papers. Yeah. So I do the perp walk. Perp walk, I get in there, and here comes the hip-hop police. 
Ed, we just, you know, we just want your side of the story. Lawyer. That's it. Ed, we just wanted to say, you know, we out here trying to look out for you. L-A-W-Y-E-R, motherfucker. Lawyer. Yeah. And that's the word that everybody has to learn. When you get arrested, don't say shit. You know it now, right, right? Oh, believe me. You know it now. And, and you know something? You, the, the, the trick, and I'm glad you're out here teaching people mm -hmm. and going in and going into these schools and going into these colleges and teach these young black men and women the fucking nasty, dirty tricks that they pull on you. Yeah. yeah. They, had, they had a whole, uh, um, they did a whole documentary on why people confess yeah. who didn't do shit. Yeah. And I tell people, if, if you don't believe it, go look up the re-technique. Seven steps on how you can get somebody to confess. This is stuff that they practice. Right. They got a guy who goes around the country teaching this shit. And even he knows, yeah, you can get somebody who is innocent to confess. Right. So they know how this stuff goes. Yeah, absolutely. And they, and, they, and you were a kid. Yeah. And they pull this shit on grown people yeah. at work. Yeah, they do. They put it on grown people. They put it on grown people, grown ass people, and it works. And you're a kid, mm -hmm. and it worked on yeah. you. Yeah, I remember Yusuf saying, um, you know, this was a conspiracy. And Ken Burns told him, he said, this ain't a conspiracy. This is done deliberately. This was done. This is meant to be done to you. You know what I'm saying? You you guys got to rise up above it. He knows. Like, this isn't, this, 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 this somebody got to be on top, somebody got to be on the bottom. They picked us to be on the bottom. It's up to us to fight to get to the top. I'm going to leave it at that. Raymond Santana, thank you for being here, man. God bless you, bro. My man. Thank and you. I'm glad you came through because this needed to be said. And I hope that parents that are of my age group that love my podcast will play this podcast and make your kids, especially our young black, Latino males, and, and, you know, Latino males and black males, y'all need to hear this because this can happen to you. Mm -hmm. This can happen. It happens. It continuously happens. And until we make this shit correct, it's going to happen again. Yeah. Thank you, Raymond. Well, appreciate I appreciate it. it. Thank y'all for listening to the Come On Son, the podcast. Man, y'all keep God first. Everything else will fall into place. We'll talk at you, with you, to you, and about your ass next Monday. Thanks to Krista Hayes, my executive producer, along with Kimana Paulus, my executive producer. Uh, producer and manager and listen man y'all be well man till next time we ride together slide together laugh out loud together ed lover bringing you come on son the podcast remember i always give you the good shit never the bullshit come on son now get the fuck out of here with that bullshit this ed lover podcast is being done in conjunction with cigars international make sure you check out cigarsinternational.com for all your cigar needs this episode of Come On, Son, the podcast is produced and engineered by co-executive producers Kimana Paulus and Krista Hayes. Recorded at Mean Street Studios in downtown Atlanta, Georgia, this is an official Loudspeakers Network podcast.